Now turn to part one. Part one. You will hear a woman phoning a hotel about holding a party there. First, you have some time to look at questions one to seven. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 7. Good morning, Clare House Hotel. Andrew speaking. I'm the events manager. Good morning, Andrew. My name's Samantha. I'm arranging a party for my parents' 50th wedding anniversary, and I'm ringing to ask about hiring a room sometime next September. Also, my parents and several of the guests will need accommodation. OK. I'm sure we can help you with that. Will you be having a sit-down meal or a buffet? Probably a sit-down. And do you know how many people there'll be? Around 80, I think. Well, we have two rooms that can hold that number. One is the Adelphi room. That can seat 85 or hold over 100 if people are standing for a buffet. Right. If you have live music, there's room for four or five musicians in the gallery overlooking the room. Our guests usually appreciate the fact that the music can be loud enough for dancing but not too loud for conversation. Yes. I really don't like it when you can't talk. Exactly. Now, the Adelphi room is at the back of the hotel, and there are French windows leading out onto the terrace. This has a beautiful display of pots of roses at that time of the year. Which direction does it face? Southwest. So that side of the hotel gets the sun in the afternoon and early evening. Very nice. From the terrace, you can see the area of trees within the grounds of the hotel. Or you can stroll through there to the river. That's on the far side, so it isn't visible from the hotel. OK. Then another option is the Carlton Room. This is a bit bigger. It can hold up to 110 people. And it has the advantage of a stage, which is useful if you have any entertainment. Or, indeed, a small band can fit onto it. Hmm. And can you go outside from the room? No. The Carlton Room is on the first floor. But on one side, the windows look out onto the lake. Lovely. I think either of those rooms would be suitable. Can I tell you about some of the options we offer in addition? Please do. As well as a meal, you can have an MC, a Master of Ceremonies who'll be with you throughout the party. What exactly is the MC's function? I suppose they make a speech during the meal if we need one, do they? That's right. All our MCs are trained as public speakers, so they can easily get people's attention. Many guests are glad to have someone who can make themselves heard above the chatter. And they're also your support. If anything goes wrong, the MC will deal with it so you can relax. Great. I'll need to ask you about food, but something else that's important is accommodation. You obviously have rooms in the hotel, but do you also have any other accommodation? Like cabins, for example? Yes, there are five in the grounds, all self-contained. They each sleep two to four people and have their own living room, bathroom and small kitchen. That sounds perfect for what we'll need. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 8 
to 10. Now listen and answer questions 8 to 10. Now, you have various facilities, don't you? Are they all included in the price of hiring the room? The pool, for instance? Normally, you'd be able to use it, but it'll be closed throughout September for refurbishment, I'm afraid. The gym will be available, though, at no extra charge. That's open all day from 6 in the morning until midnight. Right. And the tennis courts, but there is a small additional payment for those. We have four courts, and it's worth booking in advance, if you possibly can, as there can be quite a long waiting list for them. Right. Now, could we discuss the food? This would be dinner around seven o'clock. That is the end of part one. You now have one minute to check your answers to part one. Part 2 You will hear part of a local radio program in which the head of the Park Arts Center is interviewed about events that are going to be held at the center. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 and 12. Now listen to the first part of the talk and answer questions 11 and 12. And next on City Life This Week, we have with us in the studio Harvey Bowles, head of the Park Arts Centre. He's here to tell us about forthcoming events at the centre. Harvey, welcome. Hello, thank you. So, what can we look forward to first at the Park Centre? We've got a very exciting programme lined up for you. The next event will start on the 18th of February and run till the 24th. Times for the event, twice each day at 2.30 and 7.30pm. There'll be a folk music concert and uh, we're sure this is going to be very popular. A range of excellent musicians are coming, uh, some playing for the first time in this country. And for those who want a souvenir, or for people who don't manage to get to the performances, the foyer shop will be selling a CD showcasing the great talents of the performers. Sounds good. Now you have some time to look at questions 13 to 20. Now listen to the next part of the talk and answer questions 13 to 20. <laughs> yes, and then after that, our next event is starting on the 1st of March and runs for eight days. There's a lot going on, so you'll need to look in the separate programme, which shows all the various times and so on. It also includes details of performers and ticket prices. You can pick one up from the foyer at the centre. Yes, this year we're hosting the Dance Festival again, and it's going to be even bigger than last year. 
It's become a major feature of the arts year, and many of the performances will be recorded on video and DVD. But uh, nothing can beat the thrill of attending the events live. We have a great range of styles, performed by over a hundred groups, representing as many as four continents. All I can say is, book early, because many of the shows are going to sell out quickly. I'm sure they will. And what do you have for us after that? Well, uh, then things get a little quieter, but no less interesting. From the 14th to the 20th of March, every evening at 8, we go into cinema mode, and we're showing a fine new film. I expect you've seen reviews of it. Love and Hope. Oh, yes, wonderful. Yes, and it's not just an ordinary screening. We're delighted that each screening will be introduced by a short lecture by the producer, who will also leave a little time for questions from the audience. Again, I recommend early booking for this. It's bound to be popular. I'll be there. <laughs> Anything else lined up at this point? Yes, we've got a special one-day event on April the 2nd. Uh, the times aren't fixed yet, but I can tell you that we're having a singing competition. Oh, yes? <laughs> There'll be a large number of entrants, and the talent should be impressive. And Channel 6 are coming, so the event is going to be shown on TV. So, come and be part of the audience. I'm sure people will want to. Well, Harvey, thank you very much for coming in and telling us all this. Details of all the events are on your website, aren't they? Yes, yes, the address is www... That is the end of part two. You now have 30 seconds to check your answers to part two. Part 3 You will hear two students, called Trudy and Stuart, who are both studying to be librarians, discussing a paper that they are going to write together. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 23. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 23. OK, Stuart, we need to start planning our paper on public libraries. Have you thought of an angle yet? Well, there's so much we could look into. How libraries have changed over the centuries, for instance, or how different countries organise them. What do you think, Trudy? Maybe we should concentrate on this country and try and relate the changes in libraries to external developments, like the fact that far more people can read than a century ago, mm. and that the local population may speak lots of different languages. We could include something about changes in the source of funding too. Yes, but remember we're only supposed to write a short paper, so it's probably best if we don't go into funding in any detail. Right. Well, shall we just brainstorm a few ideas to get started? OK. We obviously need to look at the impact of new technology, particularly the internet. Now that lots of books have been digitalised, people can access them from their own computers at home. And if everyone did that, libraries would be obsolete. Yes. But the digitalised books that are available online for free are mostly out of copyright, aren't they? And copyright in this country lasts for 70 years after the author dies. So you won't find the latest bestseller or up-to-date information. That's an important point. Anyway, I find it hard to concentrate when I'm reading a long text on a screen. I'd much rather read a physical book. And it takes longer to read on a screen. Oh, I prefer it. I suppose it's just a personal preference. Mm, I expect the libraries will go on evolving in the next few years. Some have already become centres where community activities take place, like local clubs meeting there. I think that'll become even more common. I'd like to think so. 
and that they'll still be serving their traditional function, but I'm not so sure. There are financial implications after all. What I'm afraid will happen is that books and magazines will all disappear and they'll just be rows and rows of computers. They won't look anything like the libraries we're used to. Well, we'll see. Before you hear the rest of the discussion, you have some time to look at questions 24 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 24 to 30. I've just had an idea. Why don't we make an in-depth study of our local public library as background to our paper? Yes, that'd be interesting and raise all sorts of issues. Let's make a list of possible things we could ask about, then work out some sort of structure. For instance, um, we could interview some of the staff and find out whether the library has its own budget or if that's controlled by the local council. And what their policies are. I know they don't allow food, but I'd love to find out what types of noise they ban. There always <laughs> seems to be a lot of talking, but never music. Mm. I don't know if that's a policy or it just happens. Oh, I've often wondered. Then there are things like how the library is affected by employment laws. I suppose there are rules about working hours, facilities for staff and so on. Right. Then there are other issues relating to the design of the building and how customers use it, like what measures does the library take to ensure their safety? They'd need floor coverings that aren't slippery, and emergency exits, for instance. Mm. Oh, and another thing, there's the question of the kind of insurance the library needs to have in case anyone gets injured. Yes, that's something else to find out. You know something I've often wondered? What's that? Well, you know they've got an archive of local newspapers going back years. Well, next to it, they've got the diary of a well-known politician from the late 19th century. I wonder why it's there. Do you know what his connection was with this area? No idea. Let's add it to our list of things to find out. Oh, I've just thought, you know people might ask in the library about local organisations, like sports clubs? Mm. Well, I wonder if they keep a database or whether they just look online. Right. I quite fancy finding out what the differences are between a library that's open to the public and one that's part of a museum, for example. They must be very different. Hmm. Then something else I'd like to know is... That is the end of part three. You now have 30 seconds to check your answers to part three. Part 4 You will hear a student presenting his findings on a university research project. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen and answer questions 31 to 40. Welcome and thank you for coming. My name is Jeff Robinson and it's my pleasure to speak to you today. 
For many years now, I've had a deep interest in the perception the people of our city have had of those who are responsible for law enforcement, in particular the police. My interest began as a boy when my father worked as a policeman for the Croydon Borough. So my boyhood background is part of the reason I chose this area of study. I guess I can blame my father for being a policeman. But primarily, I'd like to think that my study would help to improve and maintain the relationship between our police and the communities in which they perform their tasks. I divided my research up into several key areas. Firstly, as I've mentioned, was the level of public satisfaction with the service provided by local police. Research throughout the 80s showed that levels of satisfaction with police in England remain mostly unchanged. There was some change in the late 1980s where there was a significant improvement. This has changed in the mid-1990s where it has been on a decline again. One of the significant factors which contributed to satisfaction was whether or not respondents had seen an officer on foot patrol within the last three weeks. Another factor which determined satisfaction was whether or not the respondent had been the victim of a crime. If they had, satisfaction was quite low. Women also tended to be slightly less satisfied than men, as too were those who were unemployed versus those employed. The second major area of my research involved finding out when a member of the public decided to report a crime. Unfortunately, crimes committed in England are increasing, but not so the reporting of them. Certainly, the seriousness of crimes played a part. People who suffered theft were less likely to report it to the police whereas people who suffered bodily harm almost always contacted police. My research found that the seriousness of the crime certainly played a part in the reporting of it. From this finding, further study into what the public consider to be a serious crime. The third area of inquiry concerned how well police handled a reported crime from the point of view of the victim. Because of the large number of crimes and huge number of responses needed to validate my research, I decided to focus only on three crimes. I then divided those crimes into focus groups consisting of those who were affected by those crimes. The first crime I focused on was assault. I interviewed focus groups of men and women and the results were the same for both. Those who had been victims of this particular crime were happy overall with the way in which police handled the situation. Theft was divided into household and business crimes. With the results showing the former group were not very happy with the level of service and the latter very happy. From these results I can only gather that business is given a priority when it comes to the reporting of theft. The last category of crime was vandalism or property damage. This particular category revealed that both groups of respondents, city dwellers and the people living in the country were very happy with the degree of service rendered by police. That is the end of part four. You now have one minute to check your answers to part four. That is the end of the listening test. In the IELTS test, you would now have 10 minutes to transfer your answers to the answer sheet. Many find the IELTS reading test to be a challenging hurdle in their path to achieving their desired band score. It's a test that demands focus, speed, and a strategic approach. Imagine yourself facing a mountain of text with a ticking clock adding to the pressure. That's the IELTS reading test for some, but don't worry, with the right strategies and a bit of practice, you can conquer this challenge and achieve your desired score. 
Think of it like this, you wouldn't run a marathon without training, right? The same applies to the IELTS reading test. You need to familiarize yourself with the test format, question types, and develop effective reading strategies. Just like a marathon runner paces themselves, you need to learn to manage your time effectively during the test. Remember, the ILTS reading test is not about understanding every single word. It's about efficiently finding the information you need to answer the questions accurately. It's about developing the ability to quickly grasp the main ideas, identify keywords, and locate specific details within a limited time frame. So, let's explore some practical tips and tricks to help you become a more confident and successful ILTS reader. Time management is crucial in the IELTS reading test. With only 60 minutes to answer 40 questions based on three lengthy passages, every second counts. It's like a carefully choreographed dance where you need to move swiftly and gracefully from one question to the next, ensuring that you allocate enough time to each section. A common mistake many test takers make is spending too much time on a single question, only to find themselves rushing through the remaining ones. To avoid this pitfall, start by familiarizing yourself with the test format and the different question types. The ILTS reading test consists of three passages, each with 13 to 14 questions. You have 20 minutes per passage, so stick to that time limit. Practice pacing yourself during your preparation. A helpful strategy is to allocate a specific amount of time for each question and try to stick to it as closely as possible. For example, you could aim to spend one to two minutes on each question, leaving some buffer time for the more challenging ones. Remember, every question carries one mark so don't get bogged down by a difficult question at the expense of easier ones. If you find yourself struggling with a particular question, mark it and move on. You can always return to it later if you have time to spare. The key is to keep moving and try to attempt all the questions within the allocated time. With practice and a strategic approach to time management, you can ensure that you have sufficient time to tackle all the questions and maximize your chances of achieving a higher score. Keywords are like signposts in the ILTS reading passages, guiding you to the relevant information needed to answer the questions. They are the crucial words or phrases that carry the most meaning and help you locate specific details within the text. Think of it like searching for a particular dish in a cookbook. You wouldn't flip through every single page. You'd use keywords like the dish's name or key ingredients to navigate directly to the recipe. Similarly, in the ILTS reading test, Identifying and underlining keywords in both the questions and the passages is essential for quickly locating the required information. For instance, if a question asks, what is the main cause of climate change according to the author? The keywords would be main cause, climate change, and author. By scanning the passage for these keywords or their synonyms, you can quickly pinpoint the relevant section and find the answer. However, keep in mind that the keywords in the questions may not always be explicitly stated in the passage. Sometimes you may encounter synonyms, paraphrases, or related concepts. Therefore, it's important to develop the ability to recognize these variations and understand their connection to the original keywords. For example, instead of climate change, the passage might use terms like global warming or environmental degradation. By mastering the art of keyword identification and understanding their contextual variations, you can effectively navigate through the IELTS reading passages locate relevant information swiftly, and answer questions with greater accuracy and confidence. Remember, keywords are your compass in the vast sea of information, guiding you towards your desired destination, a higher band score.